Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> uh, I kind of, I um, remember talking to someone about like will it be in like well, in like like the old version <laughs> the version, the version and or okay, hi. Um, so as I was just telling people who are here, um, in the middle of my last lecture right before I came here my computer suddenly went mm -hmm. and then <laughs> um, and then the, the screen went black and it like restarted and so hopefully that won't happen again but if it does happen again uh and you're there on zoom or whatever you can you can see if I come back hopefully if it does happen it will come back again <laughs> I don't know <laughs> anyway all right um and uh, I should ask again if there are questions about the first writing assignment. I never actually went over that in the class, I don't think. Um, yeah. I, I think like, I think like the problem kind of is like pretty clear to me, but I would like, in terms of like what an interpretation is, in terms of like what an interpretation is, could you maybe provide like an example? It doesn't have to be of the prompt, but yeah, just of anything. Well, I mean, so I like I do this all the time, you know, when I'm lecturing, right? Like I, you know, they well, and. And it's this this assignment is really about doing the first step, right? So you know, so so first you say, does it mean this? Well, but that's kind of weird because, and then you say, well, maybe he means this. Now, like I mean, um, sometimes I, I wish I could. I should have found some better prompts, maybe, where where there would be more things like this. That you know, sometimes it comes down to a question of like, what does he mean by or here? <laughs> right? You know, like when someone says this happens a lot in philosophical texts, including it's come up in this course. I'm pretty sure, although I don't remember a precise example. That like when someone says X or Y, um, sometimes this can mean that like X or in other words, Y, right? So then X and Y are the same. And other times it can mean that these are two alternatives. So I'll take my time what the example we actually came up with. Um, but so like, I mean, this is particularly focused, right? I mean, on a, and like I said, I I wish maybe I could have come up with with prompts that are that have more of this kind of thing in them. But you know, but a lot of times it's more like it's not at this low level, but it's like um, you know. So uh, what really is the difference between an abstract idea and a particular idea? What's the key difference? Um, and you can see some things that 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 argue for one way, and some things that argue for another way. And I mean, um, um, and they'd be focused in one or two sentences. Although, of course, you have to know what he says other places to see the problem, right? But you know, so like he's, you know, is abstraction basically making more general by taking pieces of the idea out? Um, in which case, the most the simple idea would be the most abstract possible idea. And he does talk that way, but then on the other hand, that's weird because they're supposed to be these particular simple ideas that are first ideas that infants have, right? So, you know, um, so there I just did talk about one of the plots. So, yeah, it's that kind of, and, you know, like in the end, you may decide one interpretation is right and the other is wrong. Or you may not be sure. I mean, but even when you decide, you oftentimes there's still problems left over with the 
interpretation you choose, right? Which like you hope no one notices or <laughs> something, right? Like, oh, well, there really is that place over there where he seems to say the opposite, but it must mean something else. I don't know why. Yeah. So, uh, um, but even if you do decide that one of them is definitely right and the other is definitely wrong, still that 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 first stage of like suspending, you know, not being sure what it means is like an important stage in in understanding the text. Does that make it a little bit clearer? What the, okay. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that I understood this, but it's not supposed to be your interpretation. So like the one you can file say yeah, either of them. Uh, well, oh, well, it, it doesn't say it can't. I don't think I said it can't be something you heard in class. No, I mean, but of course they can't. They can't both be what you heard in class. Yeah. Unless I really gave two interpretations in class, but <laughs> um, which sometimes I do. But yeah, so um, no, you don't have to avoid saying the same thing that I said. If that's your, I mean. Boy, it would be great if 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 someone understands what I'm saying well enough. But <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. All right. <laughs> All right. There are other questions. Okay. And I mean, some of the things that it said, you know. This is all in the instructions, but you know the like. Number one, you don't have to have a title page or a works cited page or anything like that. This is, you know, just this is just an exercise basically. Um, and, uh, you know, um, um, you probably shouldn't have to cite anything except you might want to quote some other place in Locke in your answer. And if you do that, just give the page number if you're using this edition. If you're using some other edition, tell me what edition it is. <laughs> That's but sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't ever try to teach citation formats. There isn't really a standard one for philosophy. Different journals are different, so there's no point. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and it should be two to three pages, which like is basically supposed to be a guideline for how much of an assignment this is. You know, I'm not, I don't literally like, you know, say, oh, that was only 2.75 pages. Yeah, you know, or something like that. I just read it and see if it seems like it does the assignment, you know, so like, if it's like eight pages, I'll be like, oh no, <laughs> so don't do that, please. <laughs> oh, all right, now erase this way over here. What other terms was in here before? Or, or the, some physics thing to do it. But over here it says natural law just for. <laughs> then it says 10 times. And then it says 3,000 kilograms per meter cube. That's, that's like white dwarf density. All right. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so, uh, um, so the, I think I said in, I think I said enough about names of substances last time. Although, are there questions about names of substances? Like, do people understand what the real essence and the nominal essence is supposed to be? Maybe I should go. Should I go over that thing right now? Yeah. Okay, right. So, um, so we give a name to it. We're talking about general names of substances. So we give a name to a sort of substances by how do we do it? Well, we we put together some ideas that we've got together from the same direction or whatever, right? Um, and into a complex idea. And we add to this complex idea the obscure relative idea of substance, namely that, you know, we're saying that like the qualities that caused all these simple ideas inured in the same substance. 
So this is the complex idea of the type of substance. So this could be like the idea of moles. These little dots are supposed to be the simple ideas, <laughs> right? So like maybe there's only a few of them, like yellow, heavy, uh, malleable, and soluble, and aqua regia. Aqua regia has a combination of nitric and hydrochloric acid. Anyway, um, so then, and then, I mean, we're not done when we make this idea because Locke says that, like, we can't really keep track of ideas, complex ideas, unless we have names for them. So we form this idea and we annex a name to it. Now, um, and then, like, whenever um something causes all of these simple ideas in us it agrees with this idea and so it deserves the name gold and so it's gold right i mean whatever deserves the name gold is gold um so you know there's a bunch of things out here all of which agree with this complex idea and therefore they're all gold so, like, if essence, if the essence of a sort is the standard against which you measure things to see if they belong to that sort or not, then the essence of this sort, so the essence is not the name gold, right? Like, you can't just using the name compare it. I mean, we'll see that Barclay, in effect, says this is what we do, but. Locke is saying we can't just take the name, which is arbitrary, and like compare it to all these things to determine whether they're gold. What do we compare them to? We compare them to the idea. So our abstract complex idea is the essence of the, of the species gold. What makes something gold is that it agrees with this idea. And that's what Locke calls the nominal essence. I mean, Based on this picture, it seems like it might be better to call it the ideal essence, right? It's not, this is the name, this is the idea, and this is the thing or race. So this essence doesn't really, it's not the name as essence, it's the, but he's calling it that for historical reasons or whatever. So anyway, this is the nominal essence of the sort gold is our complex idea. Um, but Locke says, it is certain that these things out here don't agree with this idea by accident, right? I mean, they have something in common because of which they agree with this idea. And I was worrying a little bit last time about how obvious that is or whatever, but... Um, but anyway, I mean, I, I think I concluded by saying that, that Locke thinks it's at least highly probable that it's not just a coincidence that this, this, and this cause the same ideas in us. It's because of something they have in common. So what can they have in common? Well, like, so the gold is an external substance. So it's a body and, you know, remember he's a mechanist. So he thinks that the properties that bodies have are size, shape, motion, solidity. What am I leaving out? I don't know. Anyway, just properties like that, right? And if, I mean, um, and uh, a body that has parts, compound body, um, all, its, all its parts have those, have those properties. And, you know, so presumably that's, I think what Locke sometimes calls texture, so like, presumably, so each of these pieces of gold, and again, they are gold because they deserve the name gold, right? But each of these pieces of gold has some microscopic texture of little parts, right? This, this means little parts. <laughs> it's a diminutive. Um, similarly, 
This is the word that Locke sometimes uses for this, right? This means little body, <laughs> right? So like they, they have some arrangement of little parts. Um, perhaps some of these parts are moving relative to each other or whatever, and that's part of it. Um, but anyway, like there's something in common to these arrangements of microscopic parts in these things. And because of what's in common to that arrangement, they all call these cause these ideas in us. So, like these things are gold because they have of that common property, that, that common thing about the arrangement of their microscopic parts. Uh, so uh now, so so, if you think of the essence as of a sort as like what causes the members of the sort to have the right properties to belong to it, then it's that it's that arrangement of microscopic parts. That's what does it, right? And so you can you can think of that as the essence of the sort too. And Locke calls it the real essence. Um, but Locke says the real essence, this is confusing, but like the real essence basically isn't really an essence <laughs> of the sort. Why isn't it? Well, number one, we don't use that, that microscopic arrangement to decide whether something is gold or not, because Locke says we don't know what it is. Um, we, right, and Locke says we'll never know. You might think maybe now we do know, except we don't really think of those particles as little tiny bodies anymore and whatever, right? Um, and would Locke call what we have knowledge or probability? But anyway, we know something about that now. Um, and so, like, our relationship to gold is really different from Locke's, I think. Yeah. So simple ideas come come before the real essence. Well, it depends what you mean by before. There's different orders here, right? Like it was because so like number one, something caused these ideas in me together, right? We don't form, or Locke says we shouldn't form. Sometimes we do, but we shouldn't form like chimeric ideas of substances, like the idea of chimera, for example, right? <laughs> Um, like we we try to form ideas of substances in conform like in conformity with nature, right? So like something first did cause these ideas all together, really, and probably a lot more than one thing. It probably happened over and over. And why did that happen? Well, it happened because of this arrangement of parts that was already there. So in that sense, the real essence was first, right? But um, but. Uh, I didn't use the real essence to classify things of that sort because I, I didn't know what it was and I still don't. I used the ideas to classify them. And I mean, and there's one other reason that I'm going to get to. The other reason I, I can't, even if I knew the real essence, Locke says, I couldn't use it to, to classify things into sorts is because um, this the, these things have something in common. But they don't have everything in common. Now, like again, nowadays it's a little weird. Like in some sense, all electrons, in some really strong sense, all electrons are exactly the same as each other. To the but to the point where it's not clear whether electrons are really things, <laughs> right? You know, like because. There's no difference between electron number one being here and electron number three being here and vice versa. <laughs> right. So, but never mind that. So, so, but like Locke is saying, you know, uh, and he said based on my, he says based on my experience with, with chemistry, <laughs> well, I guess he doesn't say it's his experience, but it is his experience, right? Based on my experience with chemistry, when you take two 
like parcels of sulfur or whatever, you'll likely to find that they act really different. Right? So we would say, well, it's because they're not pure sulfur <laughs> or, some, or something like that, or they have different crystal structure, or I don't know what. But anyway, so he's saying reasonably enough, these, these have something in common, but they don't have everything in common. And moreover, here's some other thing that's not gold. So its structure is different from these, right? I mean, because if it were, if it doesn't have the same thing in common, because if it did, it would cause these ideas in me and I would classify it as gold. But it probably has some things in common with these. And moreover, like it may have something in common with this one that it doesn't share with this one. So the point is that the real essence doesn't like um, at least as far as we know doesn't provide any basis for sorting things one way rather than another. Right? Like you could divide, you could make this a sort. Um, and that's the point of Locke's whole like discussion of the different type of watches and whatever, right? That like even for the even the watch makers who know the different ways that watches can be regulated by a spring or by hard bristles or whatever, um, still uh, um, um, that doesn't tell them that those are different species of things. Right, because that to, to to do that they have to they have to know what counts as a use as a classification, and that depends on what ideas they have with names and next to them. Um, right. So, uh, okay. Is there anything else to say about names of substances? Are there questions about this? Okay, because there's one other thing left over from last time that I want to talk about before talk about knowledge. Um, all right, which is um, I guess I I would call the title of this part rhetoric. Right, this is what he discusses in um, the last section of Book Three, Chapter Ten. Um, so, I mean, I can start with this, like, like, remember I was saying last time, like, the unifying idea of book three is that the proper use of words is to communicate ideas. Um, um, now, like, one thing Barclay is going to say in response to Locke is um, um, and because he wants to claim that some that some words uh, some important words don't correspond to ideas and that some of the distinctions Locke wants to make between ideas are, are distinctions between ideas and nothing or whatever. Right, so Barclay is going to say, you know, like who says that this is the only use of language to communicate ideas? No, it has other uses, right? Like for example, to excite passions. So of course, like we know that Locke doesn't deny that. It just denies that those are proper uses, <laughs> right? So, you know, yes, you can use language for other things than communicating ideas and communicating ideas in the proper order. Um, you can use them um, to get people to do things or want things for reasons that have nothing to do with like the proper order of ideas. Um, but Locke just thinks that um, that isn't the public utility of language. 
Now, I mean, when you put it that way, um, it's not at all obvious, right? Like, what is the use of language that serves as the great tie for society and whatever? Isn't it, or isn't at least a big part of it exactly those things that that Barclay is talking about, where you use language to excite passions in people, right? Like, if you want to keep society together, is you know, is is the only important thing to be able to say things like uh, all gold is fixed and have them, you know, get the right ideas? Or is it important to say things like, you know, God is with us and and like it doesn't matter what idea of God they have or or you know, or like where, you know, whether you've provided a demonstration of that or whatever, it makes them feel dedicated to society and society needs that, right? That's what you might think. So, um, so why doesn't Locke agree with that? And I think, um, so one thing is, as, as has already come up in the new reading in book four, um, Locke thinks that if we could only speak and think clearly about it, ethics would be as demonstrative as mathematics. Morality, where, you know, here, of course, he means the law of reason, the natural law, the divine law, right? Like, um, and, you know, when he describes how these proofs were, were, would work, he mentions proving the existence of God, right? So, I, like, th these proofs would, would um, demonstrate that certain actions or characteristics are virtuous, and they would go by way of showing that God would approve of them because they're socially useful. Um, and again, Locke says that that um, we could, I mean, that's based, that's why the divine law is the law of reason. Reason could, in principle, reveal all of it to us. And what stops us from doing, what's, what, at least among the things that makes that not happen, whereas it does happen in mathematics, is that when we talk about these moral issues, we aren't careful with our words. Um, so, you know, so like if that's true, and this again is like, this is like a Socratic feature of Locke's thought, right? If, if, if that's true, then like the right use of language is not going to be to just arbitrarily get people to have certain ideas or passions or to want to do certain things or not do certain things. The right use of language is to get them to have the ideas in the proper order so that they'll see with certainty that the conclusion is true and they won't be able to ignore it. So, um, so everything turns on on um, like not using words for anything else. <laughs> um, right, so that's why Locke says, this is book three, chapter 10, section 34 on page 452. Um, All the art of rhetoric, besides order and clearness, are for nothing else but to insinuate wrong ideas, move the passions, and thereby mislead the judgment. And so indeed are perfect cheat. I'm not actually sure. I could look up what cheat meant in the 17th century. I'm not sure I understand that sentence. But anyway, our perfect cheats. That's definitely not something good. Um, um, order and clearness are the only arts of rhetoric that are that are legitimate, right? So, like, you have to learn how to put words in order so that you'll convey the right order of ideas 
you know, so here's the ideas. And we translate them to words. In such a way that the listener will get the same order of ideas as you do. And this is, you know, uh, not trivial because even though I'm drawing each of these as just a line, there's a lot of different relationships, right? Like, um, um, You know, either this is true or that is true, but this isn't true, therefore that is true. Um, right? Does it, um, uh, there's a lot of different things these arrows can signify. Um, this is just like everything about how reason puts ideas together to see agreement and disagreement of the ideas at the two ends. Um, and, you know, um, so order and clearness, because of course, if your words aren't clear, then the listener won't get the right ideas at all. Um, so that's Locke's position, but then um, there's something weird happens at the end of this section. So he's talking about why people aren't going to like this that he's saying, right? So he's saying that every other use, every other, everything else that falls under rhetoric is an abusive language. <laughs> um, it's an improper use of language. And he says people aren't going to like this because um, they like being deceived. They also like deceiving, but I think like being deceived is the more important thing. It is evident how much men love to deceive and be deceived, since rhetoric, that powerful instrument of error and deceit, has its established professors, is publicly taught, and has always been had a great reputation. And, you know, so we don't teach a lot of things called rhetoric now, but we teach writing, which is kind of like, you know, if you ask Socrates, Socrates, can you teach me to write well? He would say, well, if you want to know how to write well about medicine, should you, who should you ask? Shouldn't you ask a doctor? <laughs> and that's, that's how it would start, right? <laughs> like, um, but it's so to teach the general art of writing well is kind of, um, Right, it's it's teaching like, I mean, it could be teaching order and clearness. I guess that's you know that in that case, lock it approved it. But if it's anything else, um, um, there's it's going to be a problem. Did you ever hand up or you? Oh, no, no, it's fine. Um, so. Um, but then, so this this is the weird thing, though. I mean, first of all, we haven't explained why people like to be deceived. Um, although, I mean, I guess it's true, maybe. But anyway, so, but then he says, uh, I doubt not, but it will be thought great boldness, if not brutality in me, to have said this much against it. Eloquence, like the fair sex, has two prevailing beauties in it, to suffer itself ever to be spoken against. So, um, first of all, uh, it looks like Locke here is deliberately, and this is what I said a long time ago would happen at some point. It looks like Locke here is deliberately using the ambiguity of the word man. Right? Because when he said men is is tis evident how much men love to deceive and be deceived. So you're thinking, uh, oh, men, meaning like human beings. But then he at the end he says, like the fair sex, and presumably he's thinking, I mean. Presumably. Uh, 
yeah, I don't know in what other context this would make sense. He's thinking men versus, as opposed to women, right? So, and the analogy is supposed to be like, just as men don't want to see the fair sex spoken against because um, of their prevailing beauties, perhaps also because they want to be deceived by them. I don't know. But anyway, um, so too, they don't want to see rhetoric criticized. So, um, so something weird has happened there. And moreover, it's the kind of thing that's happened there seems to be fall under this rhetoric. Right? Like he's, he's like a verbal trick to make you um, to bring you over to his side. <laughs> um, so, um, so this is one of the, I mean, compared to, for example, Hume, we're going to talk about later, Locke is just easily seems like a pretty straightforward writer. But the truth is, there are, there are, there are even in Locke, there are things that are like tricky. Where I'm not sure what what the point is then, you know, like I mean, there's there's the surface what he's saying, but then something about the way he says it seems to undermine it, and it. You could say he just didn't notice that he was doing that. I guess that's possible, but you know, it seems like he's writing about this very topic. <laughs> yeah. So do you think he was? Do you think he was deliberately being kind of like he wasn't? trying to be like very like straightforward with the writing or was it more just yeah I'm I'm not sure and in this case I don't have a I don't have even though I've I noticed this years ago and I've been like mentioning it every time I teach this course and thinking about it I don't have a real like suggestion as to what is really going on here but it seems like there might be more going on here than than meets the eye um you know in other places, um, like, well, for example, so here's an example that I think I didn't mention this time. Like, why is the discussion of Locke's ethics? Well, actually, so first of all, here's an example I did mention, right? When he, when he, you know, like asked the question, is the will free? And he first interprets it in this weird, like over literal way in which it's absurd and says, that's not a good question. And then only a little bit later does he like say what you were really trying to ask, and then the answer is no, right? So there, I feel like I could understand why he might do that deliberately. And similarly, another thing is like why the whole discussion of ethics in the essay is put in the middle of this chapter called "Of Other Relations," and it starts off with like these really boring relations. <laughs> Right, like family relations and like the relation of whiter than and whatever. And then all of a sudden, oh, and there's also moral relations. And then like the whole basis of ethics. So like that, you know, I'm not sure, but that could be a technique for throwing certain readers off the track. Like if you, if for whatever reason, you don't, you, you, you hope they skip over this section. Yeah, now you do have your hand up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, when he says the fair effect, he he's referring to women, right? Yeah. Like, um, okay, so what, what, what I thought he was saying is that, like, uh, kind of like types of, like, like rhetorical use of language kind of becomes sort of like a cultural sacred tab, a sort of like fun, um, a sort of like unsavory to, 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 um, to speak against, I guess, in a way that, like, women sort of speak uh, out. A R or at the time. Uh, so is, is that not what he was, he was saying? Well, I mean, that is what he's saying, but he's saying it by 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 doing this thing where, you know, um, um like the people who are attracted to the prevailing beauties of rhetoric are presumably he calls them men. But presumably they're men and women, and the other genders. If although I don't think he, he has that on his radar, right? So, but in any case, um, like 
you know, but the people who are attracted to the prevailing beauties of the fair sex are presumably, I mean, again, I hesitated for a moment because of course that's not obvious, right? Like, you know, but I, but I think in this context, and if you say the prevail, the fair sex, and what, um, the, you know, the people who are attracted to the prevailing beauties of the fair sex are men as opposed to women, right? So that that's what I'm pointing is a like, um, it's a kind of like it's a transition that's made smoother than it should be by the ambiguity of the word man. Um, I mean, it's yeah, it it's not it's not that he it's not that he says it's not that he makes an invalid argument for that reason or something, right? But there is a there's like a there's an artful segue that's made possible by the, by by taking a word and like using it. As, I mean, implicitly, because the word "men" doesn't actually appear in the second sentence, right? But like it's but it's like implicitly continued into that sentence, only with a different meaning. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of like a weird question, but like when earlier he was talking about how like language should be used clearly to communicate. Uh, like the correct association of thoughts or something like that. Is this like, I don't I think I might be thinking about it like too deeply, but I was wondering if this is like an example of something that isn't as clear and like for that reason, I don't know, this is like an example of what you should not do. Well, that's what I was saying. It seems okay. to be an example of what you should not do, right? But then why is he doing it right in the exact place where he's saying that you should not do it? <laughs> Um, but yeah, anyway, as I said, I don't, I, I don't have anything particular to suggest in that respect, but it, but it, it's the kind of thing that, that you have to watch out for. And then when you see it, like, I don't know, let us do until you think of a possible explanation. Um, all right. So I'm going to go on now to book four. Uh, oh boy. All right. Well, let's keep going. So, um, okay, so book four starts by six. So book four is about knowledge and probability. Although he definitely seems to be more interested in knowledge than probability, but he, but he talks about both, right? So, and he starts off by talking about um, what knowledge is. So he says, or well, about what knowledge is about, I guess. So this is book four, chapter one, section one. Um, he says, our knowledge is only conversant about our ideas. So knowledge is all about our ideas. And in section two, he says, uh, knowledge then seems to be nothing but the perception of the connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy of any of our ideas. In this alone, it consists. So knowledge is about the agreement and disagreement of our ideas. And in fact, knowledge is just the perception of the agreement and disagreement or and disagreement of ideas. Now, by the way, so I just did something like here's here's a good example of, of, of a passage that has an interpretive issue, right? He says of the connection and agreement or disagreement and repugnancy. So there's four different terms there. I'm I'm taking that to be just one distinction, right? So that like connection and agreement go together and disagreement and repugnancy go together. Um, but I'm not sure about that. I mean, well, in any case, so um, so so knowledge is the perception of this agreement and disagreement of our ideas. Um 
So just like words only signify ideas, knowledge is only about ideas. Which, um, just as it's kind of weird in the case of words, it's kind of weird in the case of knowledge, right? Like, and Locke is gonna put this objection in, in someone's mouth. I thought knowledge was supposed to be about things. Now you're telling me it's only about my ideas? <laughs> but in any case, that's what he says. Knowledge is about agreement and disagreement of ideas. And um, therefore he classifies knowledge two different ways. One way is by the type of agreement and disagreement. So, like, I think these things are supposed to be more or less um, cross cutting, these two classifications. So, the first is by type of agreement and disagreement. And here we have like identity and diversity, relation. Um, uh, coexistence and real existence. Now, um, in some previous verses of this course, at this point, I wasted a lot of time explaining how these um, uh, correspond to cons categories, right? uh, um, but if anyone's interested, I'll just say this is quantity, quality, relation, and modality. That's how these, these four things appear in time. Um, but in any case, so like that's one, I'm going to erase this because I'm confused. Oh. <laughs> you want me to put it back? <laughs> I'll put it back. But this is common. This, right? I mean, it's especially confusing because um, they both, both lists have relation on them, but they're not in the same place. Right? There's um Locke's category of relation corresponds to what Locke calls coexistence. Um, um, okay, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste time talking. All right. So and the other um the other classification is by the way we perceive the agreement or disagreement, right? So like Remember, knowledge is the perception of agreement and disagreement of ideas. So this classification is by the way the ideas agree or disagree. This classification is by the way we perceive the agreement or disagreement. And it has two parts, although at some point kind of adds a third one. So the two parts, it definitely has our intuitive and demonstrative. At some point, then he says, Oh, and also as a third thing, we can add sentences. That, that's a little bit weird. Hopefully, I got a chance to say something about it. But, um, okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk about this, this classification first and then this classification. Um, So um, the first one, identity and diversity, um, is supposed to cover examples like white is not black, <laughs> right? So we perceive the agreement there is between, well, so I mean, you might think there's two cases, and sometimes block talks that there's two cases. One case is perceiving that the idea of white agrees with the idea of white because they're identical. That is, they're the same idea. 
and the other is perceiving that the idea of white disagrees with the idea of black because they're not the same idea. Um, um, but other times, you know, so at some point he says, all of the knowledge we get in this way is negative. Um, because the only thing we learn from it is stuff like this, white is not black. So there he's not counting this as knowledge. Right, I mean, I guess because there aren't really two ideas that agree with each other, it's the same idea. Um, so, uh, so there's something a little weird about that. Um, I mean, I guess like one way to ask this is whether Locke thinks um, Locke distinguishes between the like numerical identity and diversity of ideas and their like specific identity and diversity, right? So that is, does Locke think that there's this idea of white and then there's this other idea of white and they're different individuals even though they're exactly the same as each other? Um, or do you think that every time I have the idea of white, it's the same and that's the end of the story? Um, you know, so um, if you say the first, then it becomes even harder to understand simple modes, which are supposed to be the same idea repeated. <laughs> How can it be repeated if every time it occurs, it's just the same thing, so there would always only be one of them? Um, but on the other hand, if you say that other, some other things are cause problems, not to mention what I just said about why not count these knowledge. I don't know. Anyway, that's. That's that's as much as I understand about this. Um, it's uh, Locke says we have a ton of this knowledge. Um, uh, because take any two ideas that are different, and we um, can instantly perceive that they're not the same idea. <laughs> um, so we can have as much of this type of knowledge as we want. Um, it's, uh, um, you might say it's not very useful, although in some sense it's, Locke says it's incredibly useful. We couldn't have any knowledge without, this is the first step, the stick, like, distinguishing different ideas from each other. Without that, we couldn't have any knowledge. Um, but I guess at least you could say, it's not very interesting. <laughs> um, and it doesn't really, we don't really learn anything about external objects. Um, well, except, it does say we know necessarily the same thing can't be two, the same part of the same thing can't be two different colors, for example. How exactly we know that is not clear, but then I guess, you know, so somehow knowing that white is not black, like that tells us that. Um, white things are not black things. But that's really, a, um, that really doesn't get you very far. I mean, uh, um, if white things look black when you turn the light off, <laughs> right? So like, think, you know, something, the same thing can cause the idea of white to be at one time and the idea of black to be at another. Well, so anyway, that's that's the first kind. The second kind is um, 
relation is about um, what you might call like the, well, you might call it the qualitative similarity and dissimilarity of ideas. Although the examples that Locke gives are examples where the similarity and dissimilarity is a matter of degree. Um, so, um, right, so there can be two different ideas. Like, um, for example, the idea of this angle, and the idea of this angle. Um, and, uh, Well, versus the idea of this angle, yeah, I just, right. So, yeah, maybe this isn't the best one. Here. Maybe I really have to go straight to the triangle example. So, right, this, I mean, this is an example that Locke uses a lot, and I'm going to come back to it. And it's an interesting example because we sort of now think it's not true, but. <laughs> So, right, but that the interior angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles. So the idea of these three angles is not the, the idea of those two angles, right? So like in terms of identity and diversity, they're not the same idea. Um, but uh, they're equal in some respect. They're equal in degree. I guess that's why we call these degrees. Actually, I'm not sure if that's why. But anyway, <laughs> they're equal in degree of something. Um, uh, so uh, the knowledge of that kind of agreement and disagreement is different from the knowledge of this kind of agreement and disagreement. Um, um, and um, um, that's an example of an agreement. Uh, hang on, I'm getting a little confused here. No, I guess, okay, no, I understand this. So, like, if you look in book four, uh, chapter 17, um, paragraph 14, section 14, um, Thus, the mind perceives that an arch, we would say arc, that an arch of a circle is less than the whole circle, as clearly as it does the idea of a circle. So that's also an example of this kind of knowledge, right? I mean, of course, that in this case, the idea of the arc of the circle and the idea of the whole circle are, are you know, First of all, they disagree by this kind of disagreement. They're not the same idea. But by this kind of disagreement, we know something more about them, namely that this one is less. It's less of the same. Um, and I guess this probably, Locke doesn't say anywhere clearly what he thinks knowledge about angles is. But I think this this probably is the reason he uses this example is that he thinks that knowledge about angles is knowledge about arcs of circles, right? So like if you drew a circle of radius one around this point and around each of these points, you would get arcs. The the length of these arcs would add up to the length of that arc. Um. um and this is also 
uh, uh, important example because just so when Locke talks about people who think that our all our knowledge is founded on principles, which are then the principles they want to make innate. So, like one of those principles they want to make innate is it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. So Locke says, sure enough, that one is true, but we don't use that to deduce that white is not black. Uh, we know white is not black, if anything, better than we know that general proposition that it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. And similarly, in this case, the one of Euclid's axioms that uh, Locke discusses that's supposed to be a principle on which our mathematical knowledge is based is the whole is greater than the part. Right? And so, you know, here again, he's going to say, well, but we know that this arc is less than the whole circle. Um, if anything, better than we know the whole is greater than the part. We don't deduce it from the principle that the whole is greater than the part. Okay, so so anyway, so like this um, type of knowledge does teach us something about external things, but it teaches us something about external things um, because it seems that this type of knowledge is about, or at least the main example of it Locke gives is uh, that it's about primary qualities. So like, um, um, the fact that, that these agree with this is like going to involve some of those necessary connections between distinct ideas that, um, that we know in the case, we know some few of in the case of primary quality. And, um, and as I argued before, when you know when we know a necessary connection between distinct ideas, we know something about external objects. Because we know there has to be a necessary connection in the object also. Um, okay, so that's the second type. Um, the third type. Um, has to do especially with knowledge of substances. So, okay, I'll say one more thing about Kant, right? So Kant places the substance and accident under this category of relation. That's one way of seeing that these correspond to each other. All right, so, but anyway, um, so this has to do somehow, especially with substance. So this is, uh, Book four, chapter one, section six, page 468. Um. The third sort of agreement or disagreement to be found in our ideas which the perception of the mind is employed, sorry, to be found in our in our ideas, which the perception of the mind is employed about, is coexistence or non-coexistence in the same subject. And this belongs particularly to substances. Um, again, there's a little bit of question here. Does particularly there mean like, like especially, well, I guess especially as the same ambiguity, but does it mean like um, that it belongs to substances more than other things, or does it mean it belongs to substances in particular and not to any other thing? I think it's the latter, but the but the the wording is ambiguous. Right? So anyway, um, um, right. So in this case, two ideas agree and disagree with each other. Um, um, two ideas agree with each other if they exist together in the same subject. 
and they disagree with each other if they don't exist together in the same subject. So does Locke actually think we have any knowledge like this? Well, I mean, so here's an example of what this type of knowledge would be. Um, this is farther down in that same section, book, book four, chapter one, section six. Um, thus, when we pronounce concerning gold that it is fixed, right? So fixed means that it is not consumed by fire, or in other words, that it like has a really high evaporation point, you know. So anyway, so uh, thus when we pronounce concerning gold that it is fixed, our knowledge of this truth amounts to no more but this, that fixedness or a power to remain in the fire unconsumed is an idea that always accompanies and is joined with that particular sort of yellowness, weight, fusibility, malleableness and solubility in aqua regia, which make our complex ideas signified by the word gold. Right, I mean, so the example will change depend on what, depending on what simple ideas you put into your idea of what, right? in this case, he's assuming that the idea of gold includes yellowness, weight, usability, right? That means that it will melt in, uh, in a fire rather than being burned to ashes. Um, malleableness, right, which means it can be hammered into shape, and solubility in aqua regia. So if those are the things that are contained in our complex idea of gold, and then we say gold is fixed, we mean that fixedness, um, that is the power that causes our idea of fixedness, <laughs> I mean, of course, it's really more complicated, right? Because fixedness is one of these things where the, it's about what will happen when you apply some other body to gold, namely fire, because he thinks fire is the kind of body. <laughs> All right. So, um, but in any case, just to simplify, this, like, you know, we're saying that the power that causes our idea of fixedness always goes together in the same subject with the powers that cause our ideas of yellowness, uh, weight, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, well, so um, do we know that? And Locke's answer is that for the most part, we don't know that. Like, so for example, that statement, all gold is fixed or gold is fixed, um is uh really not an example of knowledge it's merely an example of probability because we don't perceive anything in those ideas the complex idea that contains yellowness weight feasibility and so forth and the idea of fixedness we don't when we when we perceive those ideas, we don't perceive anything that requires the qualities that cause them to coexist in the same substance, the same subject. Um, so like we can learn from a lot of experience that they often do coexist in the same subject. That so far they've always coexisted in the same subject. And like that's the kind of thing that will give rise to what Locke calls probability. But knowledge is about the perception of agreement and disagreement of our ideas. And in this case, we don't have that. Um, right, so about this very example, Locke says, um, this is book four, chapter three, section 14 on page 485. Um, Um, yeah, okay. Thus, though we see the yellow color and upon trial find the weight, malleable, malleableness, fusibility, and fixedness. Now, how he's changed the, changed the idea here. But anyway, that are united in a piece of gold, 
Yet because no one of these ideas has any evident dependence or necessary connection with the other, we cannot certainly know that where any four of these are, the fifth will be there also, how highly probable soever it may be. Right, so he's saying, like, I mean, I guess I said he changed his he changed his idea. He's 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 leaving it open how you define the idea, but define the idea using any four of these qualities, and that you won't be able to see a necessary connection with the fifth one. Yeah. Uh, so it's like similar to Kant's whole thing about how like um, and then not being able to know like the um, like the truth about the thing itself, like like we like we don't know if like the the real essence is fixed. Uh, in a way that like you perceive to be it like similar to that? Well, it's not, I mean, so Locke says actually, and this is like what part of what constitutes sensitive knowledge, like actually we do know for sure when we see something white, that something has the power to cause us to perceive the idea of white. So, um, um so we do know that we don't know what the real essence is we don't know how, why it has that power but we do know that something with that power is there um, um so i mean which does Kant disagree with I mean, no, he doesn't. It, like, if there's a disagreement with Locke about this, it's on a completely different level because, you know, because Kant agrees we know something white is there. And moreover, Kant agrees with Locke that the, um, the, pro the, the properties we should ascribe to the object are the, are the primary quality. Um, so, um, uh, so what do they disagree about? Well, or what does Kant say that Locke doesn't? Namely, that that thing that's white is a phenomenon, <laughs> um, not a noumenon. So, like, I mean, Locke's not even talking about that. Which, I mean, according to Kant, is he should basically, right? But um, so I, I don't know if that's helpful or just made it more confusing, but. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think like on this level, you know, as Kant says, transcendental idealism is empirical realism. And Locke is an empirical realist. So Kant and Locke agree about this. Um, if they disagree about something, it's about those transcendental ideas I was talking about before. Right, so, um, all right, so anyway, um, um, right, so I guess I won't read all of this, um, but, um, well, maybe I'll read it. So it's, on, it's on almost the same page. Book four, chapter three, section 10, on page 43. The general explanation is that, um, um, the reason whereof, or let me start at the beginning of the section. This, how weighty and considerable a part soever of human science is yet very narrow and scarce any at all. The reason whereof is that the simple ideas whereof our complex ideas of substances are made up are, for the most part, such as carry with them in their own nature no visible necessary connection or inconsistency with any other simple ideas whose coexistence with them we would inform ourselves about. Right, so again, we can look at the idea of gold as much as we want and compare it to the idea of fixedness and we'll see no reason that they have to go together. Yeah. Does this relate to our ideas of sense? So, like, why do we have to see that yellow goes with gold? Why is yellow part of what makes something gold? Fixedness. So, 
it's because of which ideas we decided to collect into a complex idea and a dex and name for them. Right? So um, that's 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 just another way of saying what I was saying before about how the real essence, even if we knew it, wouldn't tell us how to classify. Um, right, so if you change your idea of goals, and Locke talks about this kind of example, right? Like for someone who includes solubility in aqua regia and their idea of gold, um, then they can know certainly that all gold is soluble in aqua regia. Um, and in fact, what you know, that becomes a trifling proposition for them, right? But um, but take someone else who doesn't include the idea of walk, uh, the solubility in aqua regia and their idea of gold. They include like all those other properties. Now they can't know, but can only judge with probability that gold is soluble in aqua regia. Right? And if someone tells you gold is soluble in aqua regia, you don't know what they're telling you unless you know what their idea of gold is. Um, because like if their idea of gold includes solubility in aqua regia, then um, when they say that, they're just telling you how they define the word. And they're not giving you any information, right? But if their idea of gold doesn't include that, then they're saying that Aqua regia, solubility in aqua regia always coexists in the same subject with the things that have these other properties. Um, and so, like, um, uh, it depends on the idea and the mind of the speaker as long as it is. Okay. Um, so, uh, So like in all cases like this, Locke is, um, I guess you could say like what, what can be called the problem of induction is like already completely present. Um, um, right, so back to section 14 in the same chapter. On page 485. Um, for some reason I didn't want to. Well, here it is. For this coexistence can be no further known then it is perceived, and it cannot be perceived but either in particular subjects by the observation of our senses, or in general by the necessary connection of the ideas themselves, right? So there's like two ways we can know things. One is um, um, matters of fact, and we can only know that about particulars. And so any attempt to get uh, general knowledge, which like any kind of like agreement or disagreement of abstract ideas is, is trying to be general knowledge, right? Any attempt to get general knowledge um, in those cases will fail, or it's about relations of ideas. And in that case, we can have general knowledge. So, I mean, this is the same thing that Hume is going to say, except that Locke thinks that there, again, that there are some cases where we perceive necessary relations between ideas and the ideas are distinct. Um, so again, like, so again, for this type of knowledge, also, like I said, that the, 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 like, um, the fact that this kind of knowledge has content, unlike this one, right? Like identity and diversity, as I said, doesn't teach us anything about external things. The fact that this teaches us something about external things, and that this, so far as, I mean, this, if we had it all, has to teach us about things, right? Because it's about coexistence in the subject. 
this is hard to go, this does teach us about things. In both cases, it's because of the special nature of primary qualities. Um, it's because of those necessary uh, connections there are between some few primary qualities and the, you know, the place that where Locke says that most clearly is further back in that same section I was just reading. Indeed, some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and a visible connection one with another. As figure necessarily supposes extension, receiving or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity. Those think like those two examples are supposed to be examples. The first one is like a mathematical example, figure supposes extension. I mean, it's a little bit too abstract to be actually used in mathematics. <laughs> I know, right? But it's 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 an example that has to do with this kind of thing, with like um, um that for things to be able to have a similarity in shape, they have to also be able to have a similarity in size. That's a necessary relation between our ideas of size and shape. Um, and therefore it implies a necessary relation between the qualities of size and shape in the object. As I said, like that doesn't mean we can say the object looks like this, even without the idea, so to speak, right? Because looking like this means causing that idea, right? So it's like, you know, but nevertheless, we can know the object is exactly analogous to that. Um, whereas the other one about um, receiving uh, or communicating motion by impulse supposes solidity has to do with this. It shows that one sort of substances that we do know some general truths about as bodies, right? Like all bodies in general, <laughs> that's a sort of substance. That's right, that's so body is a, you know, general abstract name of substances. Um, and about that sort of substances, we do know some, uh, um, we do know some properties that have to be found in the same subject as the properties we classify them as bodies using, which is the, that property is solidity, basically. Right? So, whatever has solidity, we know like pushes things out of its space. Um, Um, yeah, is there anything else I want to say about this? Right, and that, I mean, I what I suggested before is that, like, it's, you know, it's because of this that these are primary qualities. Right, it's it's because they're the qualities that give us knowledge about the objects that cause our sensations, other than just that they cause our sensations. Um, that uh, uh, that it's it's because of that that these are the um, ideas that we can, in some sense, attribute to the object. Um, okay, so you know, some people are not looking happy with that last thing I said, but I'm not going to go back into that whole thing again, because uh, I want to go on to this. And then... right. So um, real existence, um, oh boy, there's way too much to say about this. 
I mean, but let me just tell you, so this seems like a weird example because it seems like, and Locke at some point describes it this way, that we're talking about the agreement between my idea and an object. Right? Like, you know, so, so, so like an example of this type of knowledge is um, one of Locke's examples, God is. <laughs> Right? So, like, what does that mean? So, you might think it means um, it's not about the relationship of my idea of God to some other idea. It's about the relationship of my idea of God to something that's not an idea. And then, if that's the case, then it would break this whole definition of knowledge, because there would be an example that doesn't fall into the definition. Um, right, so like when Locke talks about this, this is book four, chapter four, section three on page 499. But what shall be here the criterion? How shall the mind when it perceives nothing but its own ideas? Know that they agree with things themselves. So it sounds like he's saying that, but he can't be saying that because <laughs> it would go against this whole definition. I mean, I used to think maybe this is supposed to be an exception to the definition, but it doesn't, you know, first of all, he would say that, right? And he doesn't say that. Um, So I think, and I would spend more time going on details with this, but uh, going to detail with this, but I want to say something about demonstrative and intuitive knowledge before I'm still open. <laughs> so I'll just say quickly, I think what's going on here is this. Locke thinks there is an idea of existence. Right? We'll see that this is one of the things that Barclay denies. So this is the idea of existence. Um, and Locke thinks that every simple idea agrees with the idea of existence, but how does it agree with it? Well, not this way, right? I mean, it's not the same idea. Not this way and not this way. It's a special way, and that's why it's, <laughs> it gets its own um, row on the table. It's the way it agrees with that is, first of all, like all of these other forms of agreement are um, like necessary and immutable. If two ideas are different now, they'll always be different. Um, if Two ideas can coexist and always coexist in the same subject, and they always always coexist in the same subject. Right? But here we're talking about a contingent relationship. Because like I could have never had this idea. And in that case, it wouldn't have this kind of agreement with the idea of existence. But now, now that I have it, it does have that agreement. Um, so what does this agreement mean? Well, like, I think it means two different things. It means that, um, I mean, I think they're, they're kind of supposed to be the same thing looked at from two points of view, but it means, first of all, that this idea itself exists right now. Right, because Locke does talk about the existence of ideas, that we know that they exist whenever we have them. And it also means that the object of this idea exists, that it actually exists. But here, the time when it exists is 
so far unspecified. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused because it seems like for something to disagree in this way, like it doesn't make sense because for two things to disagree, they have to be to disagree. And if two things don't disagree in this way, and one of them isn't, therefore there's nothing to disagree with. So I think the answer is with simple ideas, they always agree, they never disagree. Um, right, because when we have, first of all, if we have the simple idea, then it certainly exists then. And its object either exists now or it existed in the past that I'm remembering. Right, because the mind can't make its own simple ideas. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's somehow by understanding this relation. Like, how do we know the mind can't make its own simple ideas? How can we be so sure of that? <laughs> maybe Locke thinks it's somehow visible in this relation, but it has to be. Yeah. So, does Locke account for like the idea of like remembering something? Like, maybe you thought, like, oh, there was like an apple on your teacher's desk on your teacher's desk at one point and then like it turns out there was never that apple well so like um first of all you couldn't think that unless you had seen an apple some other time right so you're just wrong about the time or as Descartes says you know um even if you manage to think of something so new that nothing at all similar to it has ever existed, still at least it must be real colors that you right. So, like, so that's why I said this is a simple idea, right? So, even if there's no such thing as an apple, you can't imagine an apple being a certain color if you haven't seen that color, according to law, right? And so, um. And that's why when he talks about skepticism about this type of knowledge, he doesn't he doesn't focus on distinguishing between sensation and imagination. He distinguishes he focuses on distinguishing between sensation and memory. Right? Because the question of whether the things that I see now are actually there is a question of whether I could get confused and think I'm perceiving them, but I'm actually remembering. Um, now, again, that applies to a simple idea. Of course, when you make a complex idea, so all of these simple ideas exist right now, and I guess the complex idea itself exists right now, but the object that comes to that complex idea need never um, actually exist. It, so to speak, possibly exists at some time, right? Insofar as these ideas don't contradict each other. So, like as far as far as I can tell, it possibly exists, but there's nothing to guarantee that it actually exists. And you know, so that's why I can think of a unicorn or whatever. Um, but I can't think of a unicorn that is a color that I've never seen. Right. <laughs> um, um, So, you know, there's a lot more to be said about this. I won't, I don't have time to say more about it or to really get into intuitive versus demonstrative knowledge. Um, but I guess I'll just say again that. Um, um, for that reason I just gave, this type of knowledge, except for this special case of knowledge of my own existence, which I don't have time to talk about, it, and the knowledge of God's existence, which is supposed to be demonstrable based on the premise that I exist. Um, except for those two cases, this we have this kind of knowledge of other things' existence, but um, but it's 
and I guess this is why a lot of confused about this, why Locke thinks this is a different kind of knowledge and that it's somehow less good than these two. That we know for certain that something is there that's causing us to have that simple idea. Um, but we only know with probability what that thing is, right? Because um, step, insofar as we can somehow use the primary qualities to, to know things about it, because, you know, like, um, like, okay, a snowball caused me to perceive white. Now I'm perceiving white, so there's something there that's white. Is it really a snowball? Well, I see the other properties I usually attribute to a snowball. I see some of them at least, or perceive some of them, but I don't know if they're gonna remain there, if they're gonna go together with yet other properties I, I, I included in my idea of a snowball. Um, so like, for example, I see, I think I see a snowball, but then I reach my hand out and instead of stopping, it just goes right through the snowball. Then I realize it wasn't a snowball, right? So, um, like, uh, um, or I see what I think is a snowball and then I walk around to the other side and I see them on the other side, rather than being, um, completed, it's just like, it's like this, right? <laughs> so it wasn't a snowball, you know? So, um, so like, um, so the answer to skepticism here is, is except insofar as we can use the primary quality somehow is really weak. It doesn't like guarantee that, that any, that, that anything that you think is there, like any substance that you think is there, is there. And um, that's all and more time than I have, so <laughs> I'll see you next week.